Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining in our Urology FRCS YouTube channel for revising the questions for the FRCS exam. Today, we are starting a new table, Emergency Urology. Interesting scenarios, Anish Floricios. And thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll discuss the emergency table and a couple of uh, most commonly asked scenarios. We'll go in a bit more in-depth uh, discussion during these sessions and we'll uh, focus on the time frame discussion when we go to the 10 minutes discussions. So you are on the emergency table. Um, we'll start now. Uh, it's a busy on-call day for you. You are the on-call doctor for urology in your hospital. Uh, you are just about to finish your ward rounds and then you get you, you are getting a call from the uh, theatres saying that the gynecology team thinks that there is a uh, injury to the bladder while they were doing a difficult hysterectomy. So what are your initial thoughts and what will be your response to this call? So my, <coughs> my initial consideration will be to go um, to theatre mm -hmm. and and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. However, I will get as much information um, during this call. I would also request to speak to the operating surgeon mm -hmm. um, to find out exactly what's going on. Um, I'll ask about um, the details of this bladder injury <clears throat> and if they suspect that there's an associated injury of um, the upper tract um, I will ask about the details of the operation and um, whether this was, um, uh, you know, previous cesarean sections making it difficult dissection. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will ask about the if the theatre has um, urological equipment such as um, cystoscopy, ureteric stands, contrast, mm -hmm. and x ray availability. Um, and then I will make my way down to theatre. Okay. So once in the theater, uh, what are you going to discuss with the surgeon and what are your plans? Uh, so, in theater, so in theater, I will um, orientate myself with the anatomy mm -hmm. um, of, of the of the injury. Mm -hmm. um, I will ask when this injury was identified. Mm -hmm. um, I will I will then um, I, I will suspect even if this is thought to be a limited bladder injury that there's also associated um upper tract injury mm -hmm. and so my my first um assessment would be to if this is a, an obvious um, injury that i can see i'll attempt to repair that okay. um, in two layers mm -hmm. with um two of like two of vicryl or, or heavy vicryl mm -hmm. and Following on from that, I will perform a cystoscopy and do bilateral retrograde studies mm -hmm. um, to assess the upper tract and and possibly insert um, ureteric stents if there's any concerns. Okay, well done. Uh, so, the surgery was a laparoscopic approach. Um, they have completed the hysterectomy. There is only, they think that there is only one centimeter rent on the dome of the bladder. They did a methylene blue installation uh, via catheter and there is leak of urine. Um, they are happy to proceed with a laparoscopic repair. Um, they think that they haven't found anything else. Possibly they are not sure whether they have nicked the ureter or not. Uh, the, the lady previously hasn't got any urinary symptoms. No, uh, this was uh, for a early stage tumor. The, there's no evidence okay. of any lymph nodes or anything. Um, no previous history of any radiotherapy and the imaging is available. Nothing you can see anything abnormal in the urinary tract. So how okay. do you want to proceed from here? So uh, with, with under my, um, well, I, I, I will offer to repair the bladder myself um, laparoscopically. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll scrub in and, and give them a hand. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, I'll, I'll supervise them to perform the bladder repair. Okay. And after that, I will then perform a formal cystoscopy mm -hmm. and inspect the bladder mm -hmm. and use the opportunity to do bilateral ret retrograde studies as well to check the integrity of the upper urinary tract and ureters. Okay. So you 
did the cystoscopy and you wait for any efflux coming from the ureters. Unfortunately, there is no efflux you can note from the left ureter orifice. So as, as you have mentioned, you are proceeding with a, a left retrograde study and you could see that um, the contrast is not passing beyond the pelvic brim beyond the level of the pelvic, pelvic brim. So what are, okay. what are you suspecting here? So I, I, I suspect that there's been a uh, left ureteric injury um, inadvertently at the level of the pelvic brim. Mm -hmm. And um, and this could either be a situ ligation or, or even um, a thermal injury mm -hmm. with uh, laparoscopic equipment. Okay. So I will um, document the retrograde studies mm -hmm. and save them on packs mm -hmm. i will then proceed to um a semi-rigid retroscopy to visualize um this area and, and take pictures mm -hmm. um, i'll gently try to pass a guide wire to see if this if a guide wire will get past this mm -hmm. and, and if it's possible to to stand this patient mm -hmm. um, if however um i'm unable to to get past um this obstruction or injury mm -hmm. then my options would be to do a primary repair mm -hmm. um, there and then in, in theater mm -hmm. um, spatulated tension free repair um, and okay. and then <clears throat> proceed from there all right so the gynecology surgeon admits that he hasn't used any sutures in that area but they had to use lots of uh, bipolar diathermy using Ligasure because of a bit of inadvertent bleeding on the left side. So they are also suspecting possible thermal injury to the ureter. Um, you tried the guide where it is not passing beyond the level of the structure. You did the semi-rigid ureteroscope, just you can see only a blind ending ureter. Um, what will be your approach to the ureteric repair? So my approach could be um, either laparoscopic or, or open. Mm -hmm. um, laparoscopically, I will identify and dissect out um, the ureter proximal to or proximal and distal to the pelvic brim mm -hmm. um, and see if there's continuity or if this has been um, transected. Mm -hmm. um, and this would be the same principles um, for open surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, and once I've, I've identified and dissected the ureter, the principles of repair. Um, will be to um, to debride any devitalized ureter, mm -hmm. um, perform um, a spatulated tension-free anastomosis around the ureter extent, mm -hmm. um, isolate the repair with um, an omentum, mm -hmm. if possible, um, insert a non-suction drain um, to this area, and and give post-operative antibiotics okay um regarding the laparoscopic repair of ureter will you do it by yourself or will you ask any help of your colleagues so because this is um, a complex case i will i will involve uh, my senior colleagues mm -hmm. the especially the upper track surgeons who are more experienced in this area okay and uh, your colleague is in now so you uh, established that there is at least two to three centimeter loss of ureter due to the thermal damage. Um, what are the options? Sorry, before that, uh, how do you classify ureteric injury? So ureteric injury is classified based on the um, American Association for Surgery of Trauma mm -hmm. and classification. And it's graded from grade um, one to five. Mm -hmm. um, so grade one being i can't, I can't remember exactly yeah. i mean yeah uh, even, even though it is not important for this uh, it is based on the trauma but still uh, if uh, that's a common question in the exam so grade one is only hematoma yeah and grade two and three is laceration so two is laceration yeah. less than involving less than 50 percent of circumference yeah and three, I remember so, now. Yeah. yeah okay you can you can proceed yeah. Yeah, so um, hematoma is grade one. Grade two is um, laceration. So 
um, less than 50%, mm -hmm. grade 3 more than 50%, mm -hmm. um, grade 4 and 5 are complete transaction, mm -hmm. uh, grade 4 being transaction um, with less than 2 centimeter devitalized ureter or, or separation, mm -hmm. and grade 5 more than 2 centimeters. Well done. And what are the options? Because uh, you may guess that primary anastomosis might not be, or primary repair might not be possible. Uh, for this three almost three centimeter loss of the ureter. So if the primary anastomosis is not possible in a tension free manner, what are the other options for for this lady? So given that this is still um, a mid ureteric injury mm -hmm. or just around the mid ureter, mm -hmm. um, an option could be to raise the Bavari flap mm -hmm. to um, anastomose onto the ureter. Mm -hmm. um, or, or another option is to uh, if this is not possible, to consider ileal interposition or a trans ureteral utrostomy. Okay. Uh, what about psoas hitch? So, psoas hitch is, is possible, but I think this is a bit high mm -hmm. um, at the level of the, the pelvic brim. Pelvic brim. Okay. may be high for a psoas hitch, but okay. it is also a possibility if the bladder can be hitched okay. up to that level. Exactly. So we always go in a stepwise manner, isn't it? So we always try for the primary anastomosis. If not possible, mm -hmm. then the second step of us hitch. If not possible, then bovary flap. Because bovary flap, even there are reports that you can take bovary flap up to the level of the pelvis sometimes if the bladder is, uh, has a good capacity. Uh, yep. And uh, if nothing works, ileal interposition or the trans uh, ureter ureterostomy. Okay. Um, what is the... Uh, which which nerve is injured in which nerve is at risk of injury in psoas hitch? The joint of femoral nerve. Okay, and um, if there is no expertise available in the hospital, uh, if you are if you are like a early surgeon in your career, there is no laparoscopic uh, surgeons or anyone available to do bowery flap. In this situation, what is your option? So the option will be to um, nephrostomize these patients mm -hmm. and arrange um, urgent transfer to a tertiary center okay. where um, repair can be done. Okay. Well done. Uh, so you had a very uh, challenging time. Uh, fortunately, you were able to do the psoas hitch and then um, you gave the necessary post-operative instructions. Uh, you are having your coffee and then you got a call from the A&E saying that they just catheterized a 75-year-old gentleman with acute urinary retention. Uh, they think that the patient was not in pain but was um, referred by GP because there was a lump in the lower abdomen. Um, on examination, they found out that it is distended bladder. They put the catheter, initially drained two, almost two liters of urine. Um, they were asking you whether they can send him back home and arrange for a talk in one week time by giving tamsulosin. What will be? What are your thoughts and what will be your response? So with this level of urine retention, uh, I'm concerned that this patient may have a high pressure um, retention. I need to know the patient's use and ease. Mm -hmm. um, and I need to ask further questions about symptoms preceding um, this episode of retention, especially history of nocturnal endiuresis, which will be pathognomic of um, high pressure retention. Okay. So... Um you will wait for the bloods to come back, isn't it? Yeah, I need to know the use and ease of a patient, yeah. Okay, so what will be your instructions, further instructions to the a &E team? So, I will, I will ask them to keep the patient in, mm -hmm. um, await the bloods to return, mm -hmm. um, monitor hourly urine outputs to see if um, this patient is diuresing, mm -hmm. which would be output of 200 mils per hour um, for two hours to qualify as diuresis. Okay, um, and so they call you back saying that uh, the bloods are back and the sodium is at borderline, low level, 131. Uh, they think uh, the patient's cognit there's no cognitive impairment. Um, they, they suspect that there is there should be a post-obstructive diuresis with, because it is diuresing around 250 mils in the last two hours. Okay. So they... They are planning to admit the patient. So, what instructions will you give to your 
uh, junior doctors and the nursing team in the ward? So I would advise to manage this patient as a high pressure retention. Mm -hmm. So this patient should not be talked. Mm -hmm. um, hourly urine output should continue to be monitored. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I will ask for line and standing blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And daily using is daily weighing. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, um, if the diuresis um, continues mm -hmm. to, to replace with IV fluids, mm -hmm. and my regimen will usually be to replace um, half of the patient's urine output mm -hmm. um, over an hour, mm -hmm. and um, keep an eye on the hemodynamic status, mm -hmm. i.e. Um, blood pressure, heart rate, and also a line and standing blood pressure. I would also document um, an ultrasound scan of the renal tract mm -hmm. to look for hydronephrosis. Okay. And um, uh, you, uh, what about the follow-up of the electrolytes? Follow-up of what, sorry? Follow-up of electrolytes. Are you happy with that 131 or will you repeat it later? I did say that we need to get daily using ease on the patient to keep an eye on the electrolytes as some of them may be prone to um, hyponatremia. Ah, okay. So, um, uh, because the uh, patient, uh, we are suspecting a post-obstructive diuresis and because it is a borderline sodium, it is better to repeat it in six hours. Okay. And uh, at, le at least early. And also, if, if it is remaining stable at six hours or if it is getting better at six hours and the diuresis is improving, then we can go for the daily monitoring. Okay. But it is, it is a recommendation to repeat the first electrolytes uh, within six, six hours. hours. Yeah, within six okay. to 12 hours. Also, there are recommendations to rule out any infection um, by sending the urine for culture and sensitivity. And as you said, yeah. uh, monitoring the blood pressure, uh, standing and lying blood pressure. Um, okay, so uh, that is done. 